Hello, I'm Corey Barnett Mincer, and I'm digitally dazed. Today, I'll be outlining my thesis, which I will be defending in May. My thesis writing is in the final stages of completion. There is still room for refinement, but I'm confident it will be done in time. I have also simultaneously been building out layouts for my book as well. Part one, who I am and why I'm here. My thesis statement. I use dynamic media to create interventions in the everyday. My work puts intentional restrictions on humans in the pursuit of creating authentic moments of connection. Today, the present moment is full of distractions triggered by the attention economy. We avoid time with our own thoughts and can quickly fill unwanted feelings with social media or web shopping spree. I cultivate conversations and cross-generational friendships and communities. We are social beings. We need more than video chat and text messages to stay connected. My thesis explores a void that still remains in our hyper-connected reality. I am in this world, but not of this world. In Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism, he refers to this Amish principle. He says the Amish prioritize the benefits generated by acting intentionally about technology over the benefits lost from the technologies they decide not to use. Their gamble is that intention trumps convenience. By day, I am a marketing design specialist at the Harvard University Employees Credit Union. I balance the demands of my professional life with my passions I explore here at MassArt. In DMI, I allow my creativity to expand beyond the corporate needs and bring more intentional practice with my graduate work. My thesis work is broken down into three main themes, healing, connection, and community, and the implementation strategies of surprise and delight and nostalgia. My personal experiences in healing physically and mentally have provided me with skills in empathy and compassion. My Jewish upbringing instills the principle of tikkun olam, which means repair the world. For some, the phrase means Jews are not only responsible for creating a model society among themselves, but also are responsible for the welfare of society at large. I contribute to repairing the world through my intentions of healing, connection, and community. Brene Brown says in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. Vulnerability opens us up for bonds that can lead us to more meaningful relationships. Community is made up of these connections that can provide us with feelings of a sense of purpose or contribution in life. This is fundamental to our social and societal balance and well-being. The implementation strategies consist of surprise, delight, and nostalgia. I craft moments that elevate the mundane. Unexpectedness makes experiences feel more meaningful and stick in our memories. For example, the emergency glitter box I installed in my office, which brings whimsy to an otherwise typical space. Scientists have concluded that one lick of ice cream can create a pang or a twinge or an ache of nostalgia. Nostalgia can transport us back to times of gladness. It doesn't just trigger our memories, it triggers real feelings. It can be a potent psychological force inducing an uplifting or happy feeling. Part two, my contextual research. The impacts of technology have enhanced our society but the costs lay in how it will impact our future. This section covers the following areas of communication and connection, the attention economy, and the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Henry David Thoreau wasn't the first person to question our global adoption of convenience culture. Finding solitude like Thoreau can be especially hard today when we can easily escape in the palm of our hands to an alternate digital reality. This reality that we can escape to is defined as the attention economy today. The Nielsen Norman Group defines the attention economy as digital products that are competing for users limited attention. The modern economy increasingly revolves around the human attention span and how products capture that attention. There's nothing harder to do than nothing, Jenny O'Dell wrote in her book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. 
How many places can you think of today where phones are banned? Maybe in the U.S. Senate hearings or in a classified meetings rooms in the CIA. But sacred spaces that Sherry Turkle refers to is something that is being harder and harder to find, where Wi-Fi and cell phone coverage can't be reached. Traditional American summer camp is a perfect example of one of these few sacred spaces left. Summer camp is a refuge or an oasis that is disconnected from the pressures of school and the triggers of everyday life for both campers and staff. It's blissfully analog. It's something author Michael Thompson describes as camp magic, which is this magic happens in an electronics free zone that fosters multi-generational community and creates meaningful daily rituals like communal meals and bunk cleanups. What is gain and what is lost when we can't avoid the screen time, when we can't escape for two months in the summer? COVID-19 is a public health crisis that has caused unintentional forms of isolation and solitude. Today, we crave in-person connections like never before. The long-term impacts of living our lives digitally is looming on the horizon. Something we miss out on during the pandemic is chance encounters. It's like when the water cooler at work becomes only a Slack channel. These chance encounters are something young and old people all around miss out on today. Pre-pandemic, the office environment allowed for chance encounters in cafe settings and coffee rooms. This is something my coworker Jackie describes as missing the most. I think that having those social interactions is important. And that's one of the things that I really like about the post-COVID world is like people talk to me socially on Slack before. They didn't do that before. Like people didn't talk to me socially at all, really. Like when I was working remote and I was the only one. Like there was none of that water cooler talk stuff that happens now because everyone's in the same boat, right? I definitely noticed that when I was working remote and I didn't talk to someone, um, like during the conversion, like we had tons of meetings, but they weren't necessarily meetings where like, you know, you were talking to someone or you had those like two seconds of chit chat beforehand or whatever, or even just seeing someone like, oh my God, like having one else on video is so much better. So much better. I understand people are resistant to it, but I'm like, it's so much better. Um, it, like I, those were my bad days. The days that I didn't talk to someone were the days that I had a bad day. Besides missing our coworkers, there's unexpected connections that feel almost impossible to meet a stranger today due to the quarantine. During the pandemic, I hope to find connection and like-minded puzzle people in my building by sharing my completed puzzles with the community of the 152 Old Colony Avenue. Just yesterday, I met Michael, a new neighbor who asked me if me and my partner were the puzzle people. He said when his wife, Hannah, saw the puzzle exchange when they were looking at the apartment, she was thrilled to know that there were puzzle people amongst the building. Part three, my case studies. All three of these case studies are experience and intervention designs. They question how we communicate, build community, and the power of unexpected experiences. My case study inspired by the work of the American composer John Cage is a manufactured narrative comprised of voicemails from my dad. The tinge of guilt and the juxtaposition of archival footage urges users to make an unexpected call to someone. The interpretation of the video became a unique personal experience to each viewer. Do Not Disturb is an interactive intervention tool intended to bring joy and whimsy to an unexpected place such as the office. Lastly, we have Analog Sunday, which was a monthly event held at Shea's Pub and Wine Bar in Harvard Square. Until the pandemic closed bars and restaurants, I offered two hours of socialization device free. The sacred space of Analog Sunday aimed to reclaim the bar experience of yesteryear, to see what happens when the attention economy is removed from human interaction in an environment once designed to cultivate connection and community. Thank you.